Oh, we're recording already. Yes, we're ready to go. Special episode of Blossom. You know, at this point, all episodes of Blossom are special. <laughs> oh, yes. In that new use of the word special. Sorry, I couldn't say that. Oh, a little bit of emotion. I'm getting all verklempt. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a topic. Let's see. Uh, hold on a sec. We've frozen the system, sir. <laughs> we have. Captain, <laughs> the engines cannot take this kind of recording. It's dead. Jim, it was worse than dead. So if my reckoning of time is correct, this should be hitting on the 19th of October. As long as your reckoning of time is correct, generally when we want something to hit on a certain date, it hits about a month and a half later than that. That's right. So hopefully that's not the case with this because that will really ruin the whole uh, point of this exercise in futility. I mean, exercise. Hence my that's Avengers cool. promo dropping a month and a half after Avengers. <laughs> it's video. I, I love October, the month of October, and I love Halloween and the Halloween season. I wanted to do something special, not to use that word too many times, but if that's the best word for this. I wanted to do something special to observe it. And earlier this year, we did the Dupo Remo, remember? Where every single day in February, I put up a podcast. And I don't think I missed a single day. Did I? Oh, yeah, we we did it. I wanted to do something similar for the Halloween season. And I don't think I gave you a choice. I just said, this is what we're doing. (laughs) Maybe I should ask your opinion since we're recording now. No, I like the idea. I enjoy that kind of stuff. And this is uh, Rich Outfield. I don't know if I said. Oh. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and I'm Big Anklevich. There are a couple of reasons besides just because I love Halloween that I thought that this would be fun to do. I, For a while there, every time you and I would get together to record, I would have us record some little side thing that we could just put as an Easter egg. I, I had a lot of fun like that because we would talk for five minutes, we would talk for ten minutes. And once we were done, it was over and I could just do whatever I wanted with it. And usually you'd put it as an outtake. Uh And I thought, boy, it would be fun if we sat down and just covered a bunch of little topics. Then also the other thing was we just had a conversation the other day about sharing our own stories and how hard that has been, or at least for me, I don't want people to listen to my stories and say that they're no good, et cetera, et cetera. We've had this conversation a million times, but it's something I got to get over. I mean, I'm in the middle of my life unless that gypsy fortune teller was correct. And I still have this fear, this teenage fear or childhood fear of somebody not liking something that I write or saying that I'm not talented or... Saying you got no future, kid? Well, that kind of... It's a self-fulfilling prophecy there, but (laughs) it's just something that we've got to do. And, And you and I have been pushing or... Okay, you've been pushing for us to do our own stuff. Just like, hey, that's what the Dune Steve should be, is us doing our own stuff. It's like Ian said the very first week we did the show, (laughs) where he's like, I'm not going to listen to your podcast anymore, but here's my parting advice. She's like, wow, thanks, sir. He he liked that episode zero so much. (laughs) He He gave it a score of zero. (laughs) He did. He's consistent. But I thought, okay, well, I'm going to have each of us do six episodes, or be, be in charge of six episodes where we say this is what the topic that we're talking about today or this is what I wanted to do. And one of those six had to be you saying this is a story that I wrote and we're going to perform it on the show. But it doesn't have to be just one. If you've got two or three stories and you want to do it, then let's do that. Okay. And the I don't. other... <laughs> well, <laughs> well but maybe you, I can get writing and, and maybe by then... But it's supposed to motivate you. Like at the, at the point that this airs, that episode where we talked about the story that you where you got the idea for the story while you were running that has aired already and you told me last week that you'll have that story done by the time that airs so hopefully you're not a liar 
Liar! Can one of them be a drabble? Does that count? Uh, since you're in charge, I guess you can do that. I mean, hopefully we could talk for a few minutes after the drabble. Right, but... yeah, we've talked before and after, I would assume, but I don't know if it'll be a drabble. But uh, yeah, I was reminded of the idea that I had once for a drabble, and I wouldn't spend the time editing it, so it wouldn't be a hundred words. It would be whatever the heck it turned out to be when I finished with it. Maybe less, maybe more, but it'll be close. It's really not much to it. Just a cheesy joke. But I'm going to do that as one. And that's fine. Like I said, you're in charge of yours. And I, hopefully I'll come up with some. The other thing that I wanted to do is we had a conversation. I think it was during Appliance of Science where the guy said that he wrote it. when It was one of the first stories that he wrote or as a teenager. Am I remembering that right? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe it wasn't. I think that was Belief, maybe. Oh, okay. Where he said it was one of the first stories. And I said, would you want to share with anybody one of the first stories that you ever wrote when you were a teenager or whatever? And I, I know that you and I work similarly in our mind. Our minds work a little bit similarly. I mean, boobies are always involved. But beyond that, it's always when we're stuck someplace doing something that's not writing where you start to think about writing and getting your ideas. And for me, I was mowing the lawn and... I was thinking about this. I got this idea while mowing the lawn. And I thought, wow, it would be fun to do like a 13 episode marathon on the Dune Steve. And you know what would be really neat is I wrote a story when I was 16 or maybe it was, you know, the summer I turned 17. That was a really scary story, I thought, as a teenager. And I've told you the backstory behind it. But I thought, you know, I wonder how well that story would hold up. So I second guessed myself and I said, well, it probably sucks and I wouldn't want anybody to read it. But then I thought, but what if we read it on the show and then we talked about it and I could say, oh, you know, today I would do this differently and I would do that differently. But just read it as this ancient document. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's because usually my tendency would be to, OK, well, let me, let me do an updated draft and change the grammatical errors. And I remember... But when I first wrote it, I had a guy going like 45 miles an hour in first gear because I didn't know how you drove a stick shift. Right. That just, what would that do to an engine? <laughs> <laughs> and so I just thought, well, that would be really fun because that story, I felt like, wow, I really created, I, I can hear Al Pacino trying to come out. Wow, I created something beautiful. I felt like, wow, this is really, really oh, wow. scary. And my friend and I read it together, I like read it aloud or I had him read it aloud or something like that. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. I, this is my calling, you know? I can write something s super scary. And, and I had this problem just the other day with that episode that I shared with people who donated to the show. It was like a paragraph idea that I had that night that I, that I came up with it. And that paragraph was just like, oh, wouldn't it be scary if? And then I turned that into a story but when i read it aloud i was like you know what this isn't scary at all hmm. crap but that paragraph was the seed for something really really scary at least in my reckoning of what is scary kind of like my reckoning of time <laughs> and i thought about it i thought well what would i have to do to make that scarier you know and it's a question i i couldn't come up with the answer i i don't know mm -hmm. i mean you take something that's a horror story or, you know, you're, you're trying to make a horror movie and somebody tells you, well, it's just, it's not scary enough. How do you fix that? Because something that scares me doesn't necessarily scare you or, you know, like, what was it? There was some movie that I saw. Oh, it was um, Drag Me to Hell, Sam Raimi's last horror movie. I went to it and re that really scared me. But it was also kind of fun. And then my brother-in-law saw it and he was just like, that movie was for babies, dude. And I was like, you're just saying that to be an asshole or did you really not think that was scary? And he's like, no, there was nothing scary in that movie. And I was just like, wow. There was no torture porn in it though. That's probably the problem. And so, yeah, like everybody has certain things that frighten them. So that's one aspect that would make it difficult of just how do I make this scarier? And the only way I know of is, well, it has to be scarier to me. You know what I mean? Like, did you see any of the paranormal activity movies those are kind of miraculous or at least i've only seen the first one so i'm going to say that movie was kind of miraculous because it's a very slow movie where not a lot happens and yet it was still a big hit 
which always blows me away when something smart or something well done or dramatic or low budget makes a lot of money because it makes me think, oh, well, this generation isn't just shit. Isn't completely lost just yet. And the, the thing with paranormal activity is it was just, you know, these people are in a house and they say, oh, gee, that's strange. And then the strangeness gets more and more strange as the movie goes along. But it's never, you know, and then the serial killer pops in and, and murders three of them or any of that stuff. You know, it's just it's like a slow burn leading up to something. And the, the moment that seemed to freak everybody out is, I, I, you know, what the gimmick is of that movie. It's a whole found footage movie where they've set up camcorders or they you know he's got a, a video camera that he's running constantly and that's all we see is what he films but they keep hearing these noises at night and having these things happen and so he sets up this camera to record all night with night vision and during the night his wife gets out of bed and walks slowly like so slowly that it's agonizing to watch around to his side of the bed and stands over him and then just stops and she just stands there and then we see the, the editor, quote unquote, fast forward the tape. And for like four hours, she's standing there and you see the time code and you, she just barely moves like you would move just in breathing or whatever. Anyway, that freaked the hell out of people. <laughs> and it was a great effect because, you know, how I've told you that stillness is scary. You know, seeing a child be calm and, you know, still is frightening or seeing a person, you know, that doesn't move there's something unnatural about that because that's our that's how we know we're alive is the movement and 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 just and you can't stand still very long while you're yeah. awake anyway we don't know why she was doing that i mean i guess maybe she was becoming possessed or something being controlled by the house but she just she didn't do anything she just stood there for all this time and then she went back to bed and they don't discover it till the next night when they're watching this <laughs> this video and and to me that that was telling to me because, of course, that scares me, the idea of, you know, you open your eyes and somebody's watching you while you're sleeping. That is a big scare to me. I mean, ever since I was a little kid, but still as an adult, the idea of opening my eyes and there's somebody in the room like standing at the foot of the bed. Oh, my gosh. That is one of my – okay, that people would find out how much I love Ben Affleck being buried alive – and waking up and seeing somebody standing in my room. Those are like my three biggest fears. Okay, maybe more the Affleck thing than the other two. Okay, hopefully you can edit this out. But I don't know what's up. Oedo T, I think, has been frozen for a while. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, sir. He is running on Windows 95. So, you know, I <laughs> we need an upgrade here at some point. Donate right? to the show, folks. Okay, but how about you? Is that. Does that frighten you, the idea of you hear a sound or whatever, and you open your eyes and there's somebody there? Yeah, totally. And that kind of stuff has happened here and there to me, or I was the one who did it, you know, like... Oh, when you killed your first wife, there's yes. Been, there's been, you know, times where I'm like, you know, going to wake up my wife and she'll turn and wake up and see me like right there, like, ah! you know, <laughs> freak out. And there's been other times where like my kids are up and they've come be like, hey, daddy, I crapped my pants or something, you know. And then I'm asleep and then all of a sudden I'm just like, ah! You must answer for your crimes, daddy. And you're like, what? There's, you know, a kid right there in my face. Daddy. Hey. Yeah, there's something really freaky. But much more freaky would be I wake up and you're standing there. Or just something like, you know, something that isn't supposed to be there. Uh, that would be freaky. Or my cat is just like right over my face or something like that. I don't know. Or the lizard just right there looking at me. Not in his cage. Not in his little tank. Okay, I, we've, we've done this to death, but I don't care. I mean, we've done so many episodes. It's all right, I think, for us to retread things that, you know, I'm afraid of this. I'm not afraid of this. But yeah, there, there, there is something about that. And many times when I've had like a bad dream or I'm in that gray area between asleep and awake, I'll open my eyes and think that I see something. And it's just the bookshelf or it's a chair or whatever. But right. when you're almost asleep or whatever, your brain tricks you that there's a man standing there. or, or And that's the noise I make. <laughs> just a coat on the coat hanger. In yeah. Yeah. And so I guess that's just my roundabout way of saying that I, I can only make it scarier to me. 
I don't know. I mean, if there was some universal trick to making something scarier, well, obviously everyone would know it, but, yeah, but, but, would do it. but the only universal trick I can think of is to make us care more about the people that are in the situation. You know, the more that you fear for them, the scarier it's got to be, right? Or do I not know what I'm talking about? I, I, I would think so. Or maybe just have more things jump out at you when you least expect it. But that really only but, works yeah. in movies. And, and the, of course, my mind goes to the movies more than to stories because I've seen a lot more horror movies than I have even read horror stories. I read a book at all for that matter. That's right. Well, no. Doesn't porn count? <laughs> If it's erotica, I've read actual magazines, printed um, words, but yeah, okay. Lots of times you'll see that with horror movies where they'll just have something move in front of the screen quickly and have a loud noise, and that you know just shock the audience. And it is a scare; it's a cheap scare, but it's still a scare. And the worst of the worst is a cat jumps out. <laughs> We've seen it in infinite number of horror movies. And, you know, the cat never just jumps out silently like cats really do. They always go, Aah! you right. know. And I'm sure at some point in the 1920s, that was done for the first time and it was brilliant. In the first talkie. <laughs> but, yeah. It, but now it just, I, I used to notice it, you know, in my horror film review site of just how often it was done. And, and Wasn't that one of your things where you certainly. put a check mark on it or a skull by it or whatever? Yeah. It, it, it reminds me, I there was a producer in L.A. that Ian got to know. And he had made this really shitty horror film in 1972. Uh, or maybe it was 75. It was one of the two. Let's say 74 and just we'll take the middle ground. Okay. And Ian and I had seen it together when we were roommates. And the reason we had gotten it was because the premise was so strong of this horror film. And then we saw it and it was just like, wow, what a turd. But gosh, what went into my mind when I heard this premise was this. And we talked about it. And we talked about it. And Ian is like, someday I'm going to be an entertainment lawyer and I'm going to meet this guy and we're going to get the rights and we're going to remake this movie. And uh, unlike everything else Ian has ever done, he actually followed up on this and he went and he met with this producer. You know, says we would like to do, we would like a chance to do a remake of it. And this is going to be our take. And, and the guy's like, oh, go for it. I'm old and I'm at death's door. I like to see, I can't remember what he said, something about youthful exuberance or whatever. Yeah, go go for it by all means. And so we're like, wow. And he's like, I've got some great news. And so I sat down and I plotted this thing out and shared it with him and Brandon, and a couple of our writer friends of, well, this is what I'm thinking. And they gave me some suggestions. And I turned this into a screenplay and we gave it to the producer. And this is the only time I ever met the producer was this meeting. And he's like, wow, I read what you guys did. Oh, well, let, let, sorry, let me interrupt. I thought it was inspired as hell. I, I was just like, wow, this is my best work. This was meant to be. I felt like this was really strong, scary, fun stuff that was capitalizing on what I hoped that movie was going to be when we rented it. And uh, the producer, he was just like, uh, well, it's not. Eh. I guess he didn't think it was crap, but he didn't think there was anything special in it. And Ian said to him, you know, well, what needs to be improved? And he goes, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> he said, I, I know I've told you this before because it was the most baffling, infuriating thing I've ever heard a person say. And Ian says, well, uh, what would you suggest? And he says, a good screenplay is like apple pie. That was it. There was no end of the sentence. <laughs> there was no second half. A good screenplay is like apple pie. It's like warm apple um, pie? <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. And so, I mean, there was no help at all, but he did give one specific suggestion. And he says, you know what you need in here, kid? At some point, you need a severed penis. I swear to you, that's what he said. At some point or at one point or someplace in the strip. He didn't designate, at least. He didn't say on page 71... He just said, you need a severed penis. Give you a particular character that needs to have it severed. Just any old... We were walking down the street and we found, lo and behold, on the sidewalk. It was so frustrating and infuriating. And I'm still upset about it, even though, though the guy is long dead. I'm still upset about it because th that was no help at all. And when Ian said, you know, what can we... What, what needs to be improved? He said the whole thing. And so... I wouldn't know where to start on that thing. 
I, I, you've never read that script, right? No, I haven't. But what I, I liked about it was there. And, and yeah, of course, I'm too close to it. It's kind of like we always talk with our, our stories and things like that. But with things that scare me, they either work or they don't. And to hear my brother-in-law say that Drag Me to Hell wasn't scary or that, you know, fill in the blank, that all oh, that wasn't scary at all. And yet it terrified me, makes me always wonder what's wrong with them, what? what's wrong with me. You know, I would say nothing's universal, really. I mean, what's going to be scary to one person isn't going to be scary to the next person. I mean, this guy may do much more horrendous things just in his basement every evening when he comes home from work. So it's hard to know what's going to be scary to some people. And it's the same way with humor. There are people that just freaking roll in the aisles for Tyler Perry movies or roll in the aisles for Will Ferrell movies or whatever. And for me, I'm not even going to bother to get into the aisle to roll in it, much less, you know. So it's, it's a subjective thing. If, if something worked for everybody, then it would be Harry Potter. And even that really doesn't work for everybody, but works for way more people than anything else ever did. It's just one of those things where you can't please them all. You just got to do your best, I think, and see how it goes. And, you know, some people are going to respond to it and others won't. And if you get lucky, you'll get one of those things that lots of people respond to. Okay. Well, and, and there's room to continue talking about this, I'm sure, and then over the next few days. I, I am planning on sharing that story that I wrote when I was 16. Although part of me is afraid that it's going to suck. Something I was so proud of all those years ago, mm -hmm. and now I'm embarrassed by. But Well, it's a historical document, so you know, you needn't be embarrassed by it. We all know it's from a long time ago, so it's not like, well, this is what I wrote last week, and oh, crap, <laughs> I spelled a lot as one word again. Oh, no, I'm still... But in audio, that shouldn't be noticeable. True. Except for that we will stop each time and go, a lot is one word here, folks. <laughs> I'm hoping not. If somebody read something that you wrote and said, make it scarier, how would you begin? What would you do? I don't know, man. Okay, the, the, the you wrote a haunted house story that I always bring up over and over again because it's probably your work that I know best because I recorded an audio version of it and it was long. Okay. But if somebody said, you know, we want to option this for a movie or something like that, but you, we, we need you to do one more draft and just, you know, concentrate on making it scarier, what would you do? I guess uh, try and come up with some scenes that included some more creepy things, some stuff that could give you that. Because, I mean, I had a kind of a general creepy vibe. Something weird was going on, and uh, you didn't really know what it was, whether this guy was going crazy or whether something was going on in his house or what. And, uh, I don't know, maybe just more scenes where you have more of that. I don't know if that makes it scarier or just longer, but that's my best guess. And I guess there's no correct answer, right? Because it's opinion and it's emotional reaction, plus it's your work. So I don't know how you strengthen the scenes that are already scary or add new ones. Use bigger words like Lovecraft did. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to veto that. <laughs> <laughs> right, but again, that's my opinion. I know there are people that just love H.P. Lovecraft. Love. There, there's a whole podcast that pays Lovecraft? people to write stories that sound like Lovecraft every year. But, you know, in Pseudopod is a, a podcast that you and I have listened to from the very beginning that's just scary stories, just horror stories. How often is one of those stories actually scary to you? Not very often, to tell you the truth. Was it Pseudopod that had the story where it was basically like there was a guy in the past that everybody loved, like an H.P. Lovecraft guy? He was like this obscure, crazy, weirdo dude that wrote stories. And this guy started going, this present day guy started going to like conventions or something. And he went to this convention and they had this, his final story. And there was like the word that turned everyone insane. And like it gets to that point of the story and... I, there was actually a point where I was like, oh, are, are they actually, they're not going to say the word. I was like, whoa, I was actually worried. I remember that, that story. The word out loud and then I would be crazy and then I would, ah, you know, it was just one of those. It was, it was funny that that's probably the most involved of any story I ever got into. A lot of their stories, I mean, 
I think it's all subjective. It's hard to make someone feel fear, especially in a short story, I would say. Much harder to do than in a novel. I don't know, because I've read a lot of Stephen King stories, and those are meant to make people feel scary for the most part. I mean, some of them aren't, but in general, they've made me feel scared. Although only some of them, I guess. The more I, an adult I became, the harder it has been to, to really tap into that primal scare thing that you have. You know, when I was a teenager, and I think the first Stephen King book I read was The Dark Half, and that one really scared me. Me enjoyed, too. I enjoyed that one a lot. It was like right at the age where, you know, that stuff would be really uh, weird and creepy. And, but, you know, like later on, you've 10 years down the road, I read... Uh, bag of bones or something and that one never seemed all that scary to me it seemed interesting there were parts that were neat and weird you know and when the ghost starts making messages using the letters on the fridge that was sort of creepy but not really I don't know, maybe it was a different style of writing because by that point like bag of bones was a really long book compared to the dark half the dark half was probably a third the size of bag of bones so maybe it was just that he went on too long and took the scare out of it by giving us too much details or something like that. But that kind of goes against what you would think, where you say make the people care about the characters more so that when scary things happen to them, they'll be more worried. Huh. Well, but did you ever read Dark Half again as an adult? I don't think I have. Okay, because I did. I think I did read it again. I read it when I was a teenager, and then I read it again as an adult. Uh-huh. And yeah, it didn't affect me like it had as a kid. But conversely, there's this story that he wrote in like 76, 75 called One for the Road and basically a Salem's Lot follow up of this family. Their car breaks down in a snowstorm and this guy runs into a bar and he's, you know, got frostbite and all that. And he's talking about his his wife and his daughter. He left them in this car and he he went for help because they got snowed in and nobody's willing to help this guy. Because he says where it was that the car broke down. Finally, you know, he's just like freaking out and he's going to go out there again, even though, you know, like he's got gray on his fingertips and stuff like that. And so the main character, who's like an old retired dude or whatever, says, I'll, I'll take you out. And so they get in the truck and they go and, and I don't know, they get the doctor or something like that. And they go and, and they find the car and, you know, it's, it's still in the snow with the engine still running and the lights on, but it's empty because the vampires have come. And they got this wife and this child. And the husband just freaks out. And he's calling for Janie, I think was the daughter's name. And he's calling for her and trying to run through this like waist high snow in this blizzard. And sh- the daughter comes and she's not wearing her coat. And she's walking on top of the snow. <sighs> and and the d- dad is like, Janie, Janie. And the little girl like puts out her hands and says, hold me, daddy. And the the main character like grabs the guy and says, that's not your daughter or whatever. And uh, the girl looks at the man, pick me up, mister. He's like, give me a hug or whatever. And he can see that her eyes are like dead and her teeth are sharp or whatever. And every time I've read that story more than anything else King has ever written because I share it with everybody. Mm-hmm. It's only like 11 pages long. And I've never not gotten scared. My, my, the hair on my arms <laughs> always stand up when she says like, hold me, mister, give me a hug, pick me up or whatever it is. There's something so ghastly about this dead little girl kind of thing that I, oh, I just love that story. And it's really scary. And here I am all these years later, still affected by it. But again, I respond to the scary child, right. that idea of, you know, of a child acting in a way that a child isn't supposed to and all that. No. But it's also King wrote differently in those days right. where he, used fewer words not to quote to Amadeus or anything like that but it's just like it's he had an economy of storytelling in those days where it's just I mean maybe it was like he wrote in a fever and he had to get it out as fast as he could it was and when cocaine I think was driving it <laughs> maybe so <laughs> but he managed in just those few words to make us care about this dude who lost his family and the main character and just made us afraid for him you know, it ends with the the guy, you know, runs out and because uh, he sees his wife or something like that. And, of course, she gets him and he just gets back in the car and they dr- he drives away. And he's like, you know, if you ever 
are driving along so-and-so road and you see a little girl, you know, it's like, don't stop, don't slow down, just keep driving or whatever. And that was the end. And oh my gosh, I just, I, I, I adore that story. There's something so universal maybe, even though we keep saying not, but just the idea of something that looks like a child, but isn't a child or something that looks like a loved one, but isn't a loved one. I think almost all of us can respond to that. Right. Of, you and know, Stephen King's used that a few more times too. Like Pet Cemetery has that at the end when Gage comes back. Yeah. Like, I want to play with you, Daddy. And yeah, and that's the thing. King wrote that when he had a near miss with his like two year old or whatever, and he just he became obsessed with that idea of what if I hadn't caught my boy in time, and he wrote this whole book about it. And oh my gosh, Pet Cemetery is scary, dude. Yeah. Because it's something. That he felt that he was terrified of, I guess, or something that ate at him. And uh, I mean, as as the years go by, maybe you start to run out of those things. Or maybe, I mean, <laughs> how many stories did King talk about that car accident in? Right. Just book after book after book after book. He continued to go back to that well. And I didn't respond to that. But, you, you know, he certainly did. My car is probably why. If you had been run over by a car in your past, then wow, that really means something to you. But And I'd be like, thank goodness, the sixth book in a row where he mentions it. But yeah, I think, again, I'm sure there are people who are like, one for the road. Rich Outfield is a douche. That's not scary at all. So there are no severed penises in one for the yeah, road. Yeah, see, that, that guy would just be like, yeah, uh, it just needs to be better. All of it does. Okay, well, I I think we've talked a lot longer than I intended to, but this is the first episode. It's the intro. We have more time because we're not trying to beat a deadline on this one. And it's like, oh my gosh, we got six hours to get the next day one out, and we're not together. But hopefully, people will enjoy this daily podcasting thing. And if they don't, well, I don't imagine they're out much money. Yeah, that's probably true. Just if tiny. you do, though. Feel free to donate. R08OT has shut down and there's no <laughs> way for us to repair him without some donations. So In this case, I'm willing to let people not donate. <laughs> I think my Mac is on its way to shutting down as well. And that will truly be the end of the show. So if we can't get that replaced, then we're screwed. So donate, I, please. I can see you saying, hey, it's a mixed blessing. <laughs> it sucks that my computer's done. But it's great that the show is too. <laughs> yeah, it crashed in our first attempt. I, like we were like two minutes in, right? Right. And yeah. it crashed. Froze up on us. But uh, geez, I I hope that people dig what we're doing right now. And and I'm just going to put it out there. If you were a writer and somebody told you you had to make it scarier, what would you do? Share it with us in the forums or in the uh, where will I put it? I'll put it on Facebook. Share it with us on Facebook. In a future episode, I will share what people said. Okay, that sounds good. Because it's a question that's lingering and it's bouncing around in my head and I don't have an answer for it. So we here we go. Another mighty experiment brought to you by the Doonstie. Woo! Be mighty. Have fun. Why not? Go forth. Your mountain awaits. What is it? <laughs> I think it was your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Oh, there it is. Okay, and good night. Ciao, baby. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, which between you and me means nothing. A large egg-legged spider. A barking spider. An ass-hat magic spider. A large egg-legged... Just eight-legged spider is so weird. Yeah, of course it's, it's eight-legged. It's like a large winged bird flew by. A large two-legged man walked by. Huh? A large woman with hair. Why? Okay.